Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everybody and welcome to the first live conversation of the International Symposium Rethinking Our Futures Art and Collaboration. My name is Aurélie Besson. I am General and Artistic Director at Moliard from Jojage, Montreal. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking from is a traditional and unceded territory of the Ghanian Gehaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. This event is also an occasion to celebrate Moliar's anniversary. For 20 years, our organization has been co-producing digital art and media art exhibitions internationally with partners in Brazil, China, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, France, and Switzerland. Today's conversation between Carmen Salas and Kefiloe Siwiza will address empathy and solidarity for the times to come. The second conversation on March 2 at 10 a.m. UTC-5 will be on the topic of collective voices for the digital decolonization with our guests, Jeb, Jeb Chumba, sorry, and John Hampton. Our third conversation titled Connecting Realities, Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality will take place between Iris Long and Noha Khan on March 4 at 6 p.m. UTC minus five. I invite you to consult the event website, moliore.ca slash symposium, where you can also watch four introductory talks that discuss some of the core themes of this event. I would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the Quebec government, and the Conseil des Arts de Montréal for their support. I would also like to thank all speakers and participants in this event, our collaborators and our team, who has been working really hard on this project. Let me introduce you the moderator of today's conversation, Tamar Tembeck, who is a talented art historian, curator and researcher whose work engages with visual cultures of illness and medicine. She is the artistic director of the Artist Run Center Oboro in Jojage, Montreal. Thank you, Tamar, and welcome. Thank you very much, Aurélie. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and thanks to you all uh, for joining us here today. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation that we'll be having. As the title of the conversation suggests, we'll be addressing approaches that privilege benevolence and altruism in the digital arts sphere. So before I hand over the floor, uh, the virtual floor to our speakers, I will just take a moment to briefly introduce each of them. And each of them will be speaking for about 10 minutes before they engage in a dialogue with each other. And just so that you know, uh, you will soon have the opportunity to input some of your questions into a chat interface and we will be receiving your questions and I will be able to take some of them uh, towards the end of our session. So our first speaker today uh, is Kefiloe Siwisa, who is a cultural worker and a curator based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Siwisa is currently, hi Siwisa. Siwisa is currently an associate at Stevenson Gallery. She previously served as the curator of Turbine Eind Turbine Art Fair and assistant curator of 154 Contemporary African Art Fair's public program. Siwisa has collaborated with institutions in South Africa, the UK, United States, and Morocco, and she holds an MFA in curating from Goldsmiths University of London, as well as a BA in Art History and Visual Culture from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. After Kefilawe, we will hear from Carmen Salas, who is a curator and a cultural producer. Hi. Hi, Carmen. Thank you for being here as well. Carmen is uh, the founder and the artistic director of Connecting the Dots, which is an international forum on creativity, art, and digital culture that has been taking place in Mexico City since 2018. She curated the forum Paradigm Shift for the Mapping Festival in Geneva from two, 2017 to 2019. And in 2009, Salas co-founded Alphaville in London, an international festival dedicated to exploring the intersection of art, technology, society, 
and digital culture through a series of conferences, exhibitions, workshops, and audiovisual events. Her most recent projects and reflections concern the role that art and culture have in driving systems change. Hopefully we'll hear about that today. So thank you to you both for being here. And I will hand over the floor to Kefiloe. Um, thank you, Tamar, for the lovely introduction. Um, I'll just wait for my presentation to come up. Um, as Tamar mentioned, I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. So um, I'll wait for the presentation to come up. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, I really will be um, kind of guiding us through thinking about the possibilities of, in a way, developing um, this idea around a conscious or rather intentional curatorial practice, which kind of underpins all artistic or cultural practices. Um, and by conscious or intentional practice, I kind of mean a form of practicing that prioritizes um, ideas around emotional literacy, empathy, and collective presenting. So really we'll be looking at kind of the politics of care on a broader level, but also nuancing the ideas around care in a way that considers them as disruptive or critical and also trying to find in a way the transformative potentialities of care and care practices. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, I'll just share a short little video, um, which I hope will kind of open us to the sensibilities around what it means to to work from a place of, of being attuned, of um, being emotionally aware and sensitized to, to our practices in that way. Thank you. Dr. Hashimoto, Managing Director and Chief of Research for the Fuji Electronic Industries, has constructed special instruments which translate the electrical output of plants into modulated sounds giving voice to a cactus. Relying on her affinity for plants, Mrs. Hashimoto looks forward to actual conversation with her cactus. Convinced that it possesses an intelligence, she is determined to teach it the Japanese alphabet. Um, so what I really love about that clip in particular is this idea around firstly um, going beyond what we think are the possibilities and I think when specific, specifically when it comes to future in the curatorial field we have to be looking beyond um, the known um, and I also like the idea of this translation or transposing of particular ideas into into um, yes an unknown an unknown field of of sorts um, and really I think as a curator in the curatorial field it's about extending ourselves in that way but it's also about asking us questions around you know accountability so why are we called to do this work how can we better honor the work that we do, um, you know, what kind of cultural constellation we're trying to build, and how can we more optimally work on building a system that is that works from a place of you know emotional intelligence and deeper empathy and from our most attuned self. And I think this idea of constantly presencing ourselves um, and placing ourselves in, in, in positions of discomfort and in positions that don't really directly privilege us is 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 part of, of a care-based practice. Um, so I want us to start to, to to kind of feel how care work can become almost an embodied systemic approach, um, in particular a disruptive yet almost generative movement making force. So this idea of a curatorial practice that is conscious and really acknowledging consciousness as 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 a very um, as, as an idea or concept that has a lot of intersections, but essentially offering a way to unpack care or ethics through this curatorial consciousness, um, and also providing then a space that embraces the failures, that embraces ethical pluralities and, um, 
and that embraces this idea of weight work um, that Christina Sharp talks about a lot. Um, and I think this idea of plurality, plurality in specific to ethics and, and, and care work is really important because um, if I take from the words of Audrey Lord, she talks about how difference must not be merely tolerated, but seen as a fund or as a resource. Um, and so in that way, um, you know, negotiating or working through the art space means working through these ethical dilemmas, you know, there are all these disparities where it comes to unethical relations and roles, or resources or opportunities. So the art world, as we know, I don't have to recount, can be quite violent and traumatic on one end, but on the other end, it can be really liberating and revolutionary. Um, and as curators, whether you or cultural workers, we almost serve as vessels. So we are, yes, guardians, we're mediators, we're facilitators, we're all these things, and all these things are invoked within, within this title, within this role. And I think it's about really sensitizing ourselves to the multiplicity of our role and um, to the watery nature of our role as well and how that role doesn't just serve putting on exhibitions. It really goes beyond that point. It really serves uh, a greater constellation of knowledge production um, and sharing. So if you go to the next slide for me, please. Um, what is really important for me is to think about um, curating kind of beyond just this idea of the center, you can go to the next slide as well. Um, it's really thinking about how curating operates on a multiplicity of planes. Um, and if you, yeah, if we go to the next slide, um, I really enjoy looking at kind of these alternative um, ways of approaching methodologies because before we can really disrupt something that's been constructed to resist change, it's really important that we think about it alternatively as well. Um, so the first, the slide before this one was really looking at how we operate in a way from the center. And so a lot of the time the art world operates from a universe, a uni voice. So really like we look at Western history, we look at you know, these embedded structural frameworks or these perceptions around value that come from a central source. And it's really about disrupting those things and disrupting those 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 approaches by then looking at um, alternative approaches. So on the screen right now, you'll see um, an illustration of the trails that crabs make um, on the sand. And what I really love about this diagram or this illustration in particular is that it shows how something can be really synchronistic in nature and repeat a formula, but at the same time it does so in a more diasporic nature. So these patterns and methodologies are um, similar, but they have devi deviations and um, they move away to, from the central idea of getting all our information and kind of framing the art world and our practices from this idea of one center. Um, and then we can skip the next slide and go to the following one. Um, and this uh, diagram in particular looks at, um, is, basically a traditional traditional Polynesian um, stick chart. So it represents map making or traditional map making. And this one in particular is really interesting for me because here we see kind of an articulation or structure that feeds off of a more intimate or, or um, a more particular idea around space or place or wayfinding. So really, this would illustrate an alternative way of practicing or going about one's curatorial practice that responds more to the nuances of the socioeconomical, environmental, political influence of the, influences of the space. I'm really looking at how the histories and the intricate, you know, unique terrain that's informed by audiences and the makers can then influence how you go about or approach your curatorial practice. So really sensitizing yourself and presenting yourself to what is what, what the environment is asking of you as a curator instead of imposing that. Um, and then the last diagram is um, of a, an actual, um, an illustration of how a fox relocates or was relocating its brood from one location to another. And there's a sense of like chaos or how this 
this, this movement from the space from one place to another can be quite um, choreographed, but at the same time chaotic. And I think that there's something about curatorial approaches that definitely has to take on this kind of intuitive approach, something that's spontaneous yet intentional, um, because in a way to sustain these kind of micro-revolutions or these, uh, these renewed, renewal of strategies within curatorial practice, there has to be this sense of intentional work, but also spontaneous and intuitive work. Um, so now you're probably asking like in terms of how then does care and empathy and that work move into, into, into a renewal of strategies. So I think it's really important obviously to disassociate ourselves from these kind of prevailing methodologies and kind of plant these seeds of deviance. And that is, can be done through the tools of really, really um, working with ideas of care, empathy and emotional intelligence. Um, so I'm not sure if my presentation is keeping up with me, but um, I take a quote which I think really speaks to this idea of care as a deviant practice or as a, as a disruptive practice from Audre Lorde again, who says, caring for myself is not self-indulgent, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So really care has always been seen as a labor um, as labor that is quite feminized, under-recognized, undervalued, and softened. Um, it's, it's, it's always been highly politicized, and the emotional, emotionally intelligent body has always historically had all these negative connotations. Um, and Bloom also writes about the need to nuance our understanding of empathy or em empathetic practices and compassion in his book Against Empathy. So he talks about this idea of like rational compassion. And I think this is really important because as much as it's important to see care as from a healing, restful and transformative practice, it's, and it's also really important to move away from kind of the softness or good versus bad binary rhetoric. Because if we consider the value of care as a disruptive or dismantling force, then in a way, what it does is that it ruptures the any surfaces that it touches and then allows for the transformation to then happen um, from that rupturing. Um, so really, it's not as passive as kind of this restful practice that almost um, is characterized by care work. It's really about a really active practice, um, you know, emotion that's in motion, um, is propelling forward. Um, and in a way, it's kind of weaponizing, for lack of a better word, care practices. Um, so I think, you know, it's really, really difficult to, to then find formulas which speak to how we can really um, exercise these tools and invigorate these tools. Um, let me just assist and say, if we could go to slide 13, um, I think for me, going back has really helped in thinking about how we can integrate ways to, 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 to um, invigorate these tools around our emotional intelligence. And when I look towards um, you know, religious and spiritual practices in particular, there are principles or codes and cues that they often provide, um, which have been there for centuries and that can be almost transposed into the curatorial field, into the art world to provide alternative ways of practicing. Um, in, in specific, I will draw for this, for this presentation on um, Zen practices, so Buddhism and these moral codes that kind of advance the practitioner, practitioners towards their Buddhahood, um, towards their enlightenment, their consciousness. Um, and these treasures and tenets and commitments that you bow towards are can be used in a way as an invitation to start to think about or draw on um, ideas of elevating our, our emotional capacity in the work that we do. Um, so the first one is, is the three treasures of a Zen peace maker. And this um, goes as follows. It says, recognizing my place in the constellation of life or the constellation of the curatorial field, um, I take refuge in the oneness of life, the diversity of life and the interdependence of in the, in the sense of Zen peacemaker um, practice, you'd say Buddha or Dharma, but I would say in, in, in the interdependence of the curator, the artist, and life. 
Um, and I think this serves as a really great foundation in thinking about how to approach the work, specifically highlighting ideas around how we organize diversity in our practice, intersections in our practice, and the idea of an interdependent um, sphere in which we work in. Um, and I think this is a really essential way of approaching um, also how we mediate and practice um, relationship making within, within the curatorial field. Um, and also it's a way of thinking more deeply about the investment in which we make the work and, and in, in our life work. And then the next one is the three tenants. Um, these three tenants, I think, are also really interesting in that they provide a way of looking at how we do our research or how we approach um, working in new spaces. Because often as curators, we, we hop from one project to the next. And I think that it's sometimes very hard to then develop our practice over a longer period of time. And they go as forth. They go, um, taking refuge in the three treasures, I vow to live a life of not knowing by giving up fixed ideas about ourselves and the universe. Um, and this idea of working from a place of not knowing, um, allowing the environment to inform um, this uh, more organic way of, of, of learning or creating new knowledge instead of working from a place of the known. And then the next point being bearing witness to the joy and suffering of the world. I think this is really about conscientizing ourselves to what is happening in the present and being responsive to that through our practice. And then the third point being taking action that arises from not knowing and bearing witness. So allowing those first two points to really pull us forward in the work that we're doing and um, kind of allowing then the work to be or to generate movement and movement making. Um, so Mark, can you just give me a sense of how many minutes I have? So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then the last point being um, this kind of commitment that the Zen peace makers uh, make, which I think allows for us to think about the work of the curator from an advocacy point of view. Um, yes, not all forms of practice embody this kind of activist perspective, but I think the presence of mind that the work can um, propel that propel that sensibility in others and also in, in, in from the audience to the makers or artists um, is really important. So these precepts say, um, living the 10 precepts, precepts, I commit to a reverence for all life, a sustainable and ethical economy. Um, I commit to equal rights for all. So really when I think about this idea of equal rights for all, I think about our commitment to um, working towards policy making, to artist rights, fair pay, um, really kind of these systemic things that need to shift. And then stewardship of the earth, um, which I think on a broader scale, uh, on broader scale from, from a social perspective, from an environmental perspective is pertinent to the work that we do. Um, so really looking at our practice from a place of how can we widen our conversation around these responsibilities, but also how can we then on a practical level integrate some of these ideas into the work that we do and obviously we can't we can't provide all the solutions but i think that it's again this idea of being practicing from a conscious or intentional place means um incorporating an awareness into into the work that we do really from a systemic level and i will leave it there thank you thank you Kefilowe. um very stimulating food for thought in terms of thinking through the role of the curator or the responsibility that a curator bears, um, not just to the objects that are brought together, but also to all the people implicated in the processes and to the infrastructures that um, allow for events and exhibitions and so on to take place. And this kind of very uh, broad perspective on uh, um, receiving and responding to alterity in so many different ways. The example with the plants being very, uh, being a very, uh, um, elaborate or a uh, clear one. So thank you for that. And I'm sure we're going to have the opportunity to discuss what this means in terms of concrete instances in practice uh, in the conversation. So I just want to remind our, our audience that you can continue to type in your questions in the chat interface that uh, they will be uh, received and hopefully uh, transmitted to our speakers. And now I would like to transition to Carmen's presentation. Thank you.
Thanks, Amar. Um, I wanted to, I would like to add a few things. Thanks for the intro. I would like to add a few things uh, before getting into my presentation, as I believe it is relevant for what we are going to be discussing today. So I wanted to explain um, why and when I got into uh, the field of art and technology, digital arts, and why I am detaching a bit from it, and the reasons why I am opening up my practice to different narratives and approaches and working relationships and who are some of the artists I'm currently working with. So one of the reasons why I got into the field of art and technology and digital arts in 2006 is because I was interested in exploring and understanding the, um, how artists uh, could use the tool to expand the way audiences could engage and interact with um, art and culture in general and how through the use of technology artists were able to uh, change the perception and interaction with the physical and the digital space. Another reason was because I was interested in uh, studying the impact and effect of technology in society. So my interest lied on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, on the one hand, I was interested in the exploration and the experimentation of the tools for creative uh, purposes. But I, on, the, on the other hand, I was also interested in uh, looking at the possible abuses of tech by people, tech corporations and the gov and government. So in terms of uh, the, the past um, three to four years have been a period of change and transformation uh, for me. I'm still transitioning towards more social and eco-social practices. And um, I'm towards practices that are more sensitive with the social and the environmental changes that we are experiencing. Um, so in regards to today's topic, I would like to start by looking at the uh, terminology, like briefly looking at the terminology of the, uh, both uh, terms, uh, empathy and solidarity. Uh, if we think about it, uh, if we can move into the next slide. Okay, so uh, these two topics are so vast and so crucial for human existence that I somehow find it difficult to look at them from just from the perspective of uh, digital arts or from a curatorial um, content or programming point of view. So I believe it will be very beneficial and very interesting to look at these terms or human values from a broader perspective, from the perspective of um, the system or from from a systematic or a sector perspective, from the uh, art and cultural sector as a whole. So that way we can consider many aspects from the uh, how the sector is constructed and is structured to uh, how the sector operates, uh, its dynamics and the um, different, the relationship between the different stakeholders. And um, it will be also very interesting to look at these topics from a behavioral and social and even a planetary perspective as everything is uh, interconnected and interrelated. Mm -hmm. So if we think about these um, topics or terms, they are not uh, regular topics. They are human values, two of the most in my opinion, two of the most hum important human values in human history. Uh, the role of empathy and solidarity are more important today than uh, I will say ever before because of the challenges we are experiencing and what lies ahead of us. So these two topics are um, essential to the development of a person and they take an essential role in our social and uh, professional interactions and they involve many, many dimensions not only creative or artistic or um, curatorial. Um, these topics are, or these values are fundamental in how we talk, how we relate to others, how we treat or how we treat or care for the environment, how we build our teams, how we design our goals and missions, and how we, for instance, pay people pay properly, which is really important. Um, so if uh, COVID-19 or uh, the pandemic has shown us a anything, is that our structures and systems, they need more care and attention than ever before. 
uh, the pandemic has exposed the fragilities or the weaknesses of our systems, including the art sector. Um, I believe crisis moments are or create opportunities uh, to um, develop uh, healthier systems, programs, and uh, even policies and relationships, human relationships as, as well. Uh, crisis, crisis or moments of uh, social crisis test our capacity to combine empathy, solidarity, and action. And it opens up an opportunity to create radical change, something that is not uh, so possible in normal times. So I believe it is the time to, um, or we are in the right window of time to create and ignite change and not just to continue doing business as usual or operating as usual or putting on events as usual. I think we are in the right time to ask ourselves what sector, life and society do we want? How can we build a sector based on these two core values? How can we make empathy and solidarity two of the most uh, or two essential tools to address the 21st century social and environmental um, changes and transformation that we are experiencing? Um, and I believe it is also the time to practice these two values even outside the traditional format of art uh, exhibitions and so on, as uh, we don't know is the, if this uh, format uh, will be possible in the future. So I believe it is um, it is the time to um, go and beyond the ideas that we want to communicate uh, or convey with our artistic or curatorial work. And um, with this approach, I'm, I'm most importantly, sorry, most importantly is about making sure that we the choices we make are based on these values. Um, with this approach, the whole sector or the whole ecosystem is involved in implementing, embedding, and fostering uh, the values of care, empathy, and solidarity. And the whole sector will benefit from, um, from these values, from good practices based on these values. And I want to end my presentation by talking about giving two examples of artists I have recently worked with, uh, that I'm also somehow working with, and uh, I hope I will continue working with in the future. If you can move the slide to the, uh, yeah, thank you. So the first artist is Gilberto Esparza. He's a Mexican artist interested in the social, economic, and political impact of new technologies on urban spaces and the environment. I want to talk about two, briefly about two projects, nomadic plants and coralysis. So nomadic plants, if you can move to the next slide. Okay. So nomadic plants is a metaphor for the alienated human condition and the impact our activity has on nature. Uh, this project is an ongoing uh, investigation and exploration that takes the format of a small robot that uh, is made of uh, recycled technology and that is uh, able to move on its own. The robot draws con uh, water from contaminated rivers and uh, decomposes its elements and helps create, um, sorry, helps create energy that in turn recycle the water and then creates a healthy life. And the project Coralysis if you can move to the next. Okay. So the project Coralysis seeks to raise awareness about the importance of um, taking care of coral reefs and also uh, as well as uh, offer possibilities to restore uh, the environment um, by collaborating with biologists and other type of scientists. So why I find this um, practice or uh, this project so all the work of Gilberto so interesting and, and important and what values emanate from his work that I find that is worth um, highlighting and sharing uh, with you today. So most of his uh, works are made with uh, recycled consumer technology and electronics. Through his work he examines the capabilities of uh, art and technology to um, affect uh, the environment and local communities in beneficial ways. Both projects, uh, these two projects, explore uh, the ability to counteract the 
damage that come with inherited uh, conception, conceptions of progress and globalization. He proposes ideas and processes to restore the landscapes and the uh, ecology we rely on. He's been researching alternative ways of uh, energy in collaboration with professionals with different disciplines. And the production and implementation of his projects are done in collaboration with um, local students, uh, community residents, and organizations. So for Gilberto, the impact and the effect of his uh, project or his work become a priority. So it's not, uh, I believe that is in his work, we can see uh, how it is not so much about what we create, but why we create and for whom. And the project uh, and the work of uh, Gilberto Esparza is about recycling, restoring, recuperating, it's about care, and it's about also empathy and solidarity with local communities, the environment, and uh, um, society and life in general. And I want to end by talking about the work of Mariana Arteaga. She's a Mexican choreographer and a curator and a dancer. I am aware she's not a digital artist and that the focus of today's talk is digital art, but I wanted to talk anyway about her practice. I'm, I'm working with her from, from my project uh, in, Mex in Mexico this year. I want to highlight how the nature and the impact of a specific practice and the values um, an artist can convey with his or her work are becoming a priority in my practice and the, um, the art form or the technique uh, takes a secondary dimension. So I'm, ju I'm just gonna talk about one project, Umbal. Uh, so Mariana developed this project in response to an incident that happened in 2014 when 43 students disappeared from <clears throat> a state in Guerrero, in Mexico, presumably murdered by criminal guns or the authorities that enabled them Mariana saw how the Mexican government repressed the mass protests, protests and thought that if um, repression could be choreographed, so could freedom and joy. So she saw in her practice an opportunity to reclaim um, the public space with uh, dance and joy and the social power of dance. And this project was first um, um, perform performed in um, Mexico City and then in Philadelphia, in both occasions with the participation of local volunteers, choreographers, and also the involving the citizens as main uh, participants. So the work of Marian Arteaga is about collabor uh, collaboration, uh, participatory practices, community building, empathy, solidarity, and joy. And I just want to end by mentioning something. I believe when artists and uh, cultural practitioners open up their work to um, collab uh, collaborate with citizens and communities uh, as main participants, the positive effects of art and culture um, are more tangible and long-lasting. Long Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, it's interesting that in, in both your presentations, what might be considered as soft skills, like these relational aspects that come with the work of curating are actually the, the underpinning essential components or the ingredients that count the most, it would appear. And yet they're not, the, they're not necessarily the things that are explicitly taught. I mean, they are the things that come with experience and with interacting with people and cultural workers, artists, and also with taking on this responsibility for care. And um, as we know, the notion of care is closely tied to the etymology of the word to curate. Um, and each of you addressed in different ways, either art practices themselves that engage with a very tangible aspect of care when it's a matter of um, impacting the environment, for instance, with an art project, but there's also some intangible aspects like um, what you were describing as a form of responding to or accommodating um, multiplicities. So maybe to begin in our exchange, um, 
I would like to hear from you a little bit more about how care is enacted or you were talking about, you know, affecting change in the way the digital arts world or the arts world in general at large, um, especially in light of what we are currently experiencing in global pandemic. What does this change look like? And in terms of also, what does it take in your practices as curators to be available to affect this kind of care that you are describing and also to receive multiplicities gift platforms for these different voices and and make the kinds of uh, contributions that you are evoking in, in each of your uh, presentations um well i I'll, I'll start i when i think about care i or practices of care i the first thing that comes to my mind is common sense in a in a way and um and i you know, when I also think about care, I think it's really important also to first think about um, self-care. Um, so take care of your own self. If you if you want to care for others, you also need to make sure that you are caring for yourself, and that uh, will permeate everything that you do. And um, when thinking about uh, practices of care, to me, I think about. It takes, as I think Kefloe has said, many, many dimensions in a, in a curatorial practice or in a producer uh, practice. And when thinking about uh, care, I, for instance, paying people properly, to me, is a huge, huge um, uh, act of care or listening to me. I'm, this is something that personally I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to listen to myself and listen to others. And I think listening to, active listening to our teams and the people we work with is really key uh, in order to be able to care. And understanding the needs of others is also um, a huge uh, act of care. Uh, so, you know, so building trust with uh, the people you work with, whether we are talking about teams or artists, um, is also really important for me. And I, you know, I have a list of things that I, I think, when I think about care, that I need to go one by one and be, uh, make sure that I touch all of them uh, in order for the work I do internally with my team or the teams I work with, and also with uh, with artists or with with institutions. Um. I think one thing that stands out for me is, um, in, in particular, when it comes to, to developing the kind of like human-centric care-based practice, right, is um, really slowing things down. I think that working specifically in a commercial space is kind of need for a fast turnaround. But in my individual practice, I I think I challenge that a lot. Um, so it's about really slowing down the processes and also um, not prioritizing the, the endpoint or, 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 or the product itself. I think that process work is something that's really undervalued within practices um, because I think that there's a lot of rich uh, knowledge that comes from the, the, pro the things that are in process and that often audiences or the wider public don't get time to, to engage with, often they see the, the, the end point. Um, and so I think it's highlighting those processes and it's also about, um, when I talk about slowing down, not only in terms of production, but also relationship and growing relationships. So it's really important for me to it's very, in a very sustained manner, develop relationships with artists in the way that I would with a family member or uh, with a loved one, because I think that ultimately the work that we do is is about those relationships, um, and that's yeah, that's essentially the work for me. It's about it's about facilitating those exchanges, and then the whatever comes out of that is, is a bonus. And I know that there's all these other demands um, from a commercial sphere or or just or just from a, or a level of labor and productivity. But I think those are the main things that I try and and and. Um, we're consciously around. 
I'd like to just also remind the audience that they have the opportunity to send in comments or questions and we'll respond to them and uh, don't be shy because uh, they won't necessarily be seen publicly. So we will receive them and filter them and then we will speak them out. You can choose whether or not you would like to uh, state your name. Um, we can read them anonymously. Um, if we, both of you also spoke about embodiment um, in different ways. Um, so I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, embodied practice, but also how does that play in a digital arts sphere? Does it come up? Like, how do you apply that in that context? And perhaps you can maybe tell us from your respective positions what you think are the most urgent challenges or even needs in the realm of the digital arts sphere with regards to benevolence and altruism specifically. Um, I would definitely say that obviously the, the digital sphere has posed challenges in, in, in the way that we navigate specifically this kind of, 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 of practice um, because it's been so um, structured around a, a way of, of working um, and now you find that practitioners that weren't necessarily so well versed in the digital sphere have been plunged into the space um, and I think that that's exactly the kind of um, challenge that is necessary to kind of um, shift how we see um, embodied practices right because an embodied practice doesn't necessarily mean it has to have this physical interaction. It means what is the ripple effect um, and how far of a reach can, can this work have on a multitude of platforms and in, 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 in various ways. Um, I also think it's meant um, as, 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 as a practitioner, um, really looking at how your role is constantly in flux and allowing oneself to be quite watery in that way and, and uh, trans just transforming as you need and, and where you need it. Um, and so not having a really um, fixed idea of what your role is. Um, and in terms of, I think one of, I would say, the urgencies around around the digital sphere um, and things that we have to be maybe aware of is the fact that you know dealing with the pandemic and kind of being plunged into the into the online world has meant that um, there are also there's also an inundation of a lot of um, content and a lot of stuff on, on 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 platforms and so I think it's also about sensitizing ourselves to the fact that there is fatigue. Um, how do we um, share ideas but not you know like completely like like swamp people with content content sake. Um, so how do we really intentionally work with the medium without just like using it because it's there. Um, and then I'd also say ideas around access as well is, is really big because a lot of us will be like, oh yes, definitely the digital sphere has created way more access, right? But um, I definitely say that in, 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 in some set communities, it's, it's actually um, created a bit of an, an issue around access as well. So I think it's also making ourselves aware that there are still places in the world that you know, access around the digital platforms, whether so it's because of digital literacy or because of just resources, is still an issue. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I'm finding a bit challenging this um, digital over uh, saturation of uh, content and, and activities, but I, I guess this is the life uh, we are living. And um, we all are seeing our uh, projects being changed to virtual uh, uh, spheres. And uh, we, we've been talking about accessibility and I think that is the good side of, one of the good side of things that uh, people from different parts of the world, for instance, are joining us today, uh, which it was a bit more complicated if we were uh, there with you in, in Montreal. Um, but I keep thinking about um, the consequences somehow that we probably don't know yet what uh, the impact on our practices and, and exchanging so much content uh, will have on, on our physical, uh, mental health or social interactions. 
And I, by talking to artists, I'm basically now working on my project in Mexico and we had to change it almost three times from 2019. Last year, we moved the event to this year with the idea that we wanted to make it physical at the, at the end of this year. And only two weeks before we took the decision to move everything online. And I'm finding how artists and my team and myself, we need to, it's not just adapting a monster structure into virtual, but also the artists also need help to understand how to change their practices to virtual. In my case, my project is about dance and we really need to think how are we going to move that online? And, and I think artists need help because I keep talking to them on a daily basis. And part of the conversations we had is how, do, how can we do this to make it meaningful for us, for the audience and for the institutions we are working with? And I think we need to put more attention into as curators, institutions, producers, we need to really Kefilo, as you said before, time is key. Time is really, really, really important. I think more than ever before, time should be a priority for thinking, creating, producing, di uh, dialogue, and, and put it at the top of everything, basically. Time is key, but often uh, we are confronted with situations where we cannot afford the time. Uh, there are many structural barriers, budget-wise, logistics-wise, in terms of limiting, restricting <laughs> our access to the commodity of time. You mentioned also mm -hmm. the digital divide, the question of access, of digital religious freedom, and so on. Um, so what are, what are some of the structural challenges that you think are there, uh, yes, in the current predicament, but also more generally. Um, you know, there was a bit of a digital utopia idea, um, I think, uh, some 20, 30 years ago, where we believed that um, it was a brave new world that was being opened onto us. And we thought that, you know, there would be a leveling of uh, access for all and so on. And we're confronted to the fact, as you just said, that that's not the reality. So what are these barriers? How do you respond to them? How do you navigate through these kinds of challenges? Well, in, um, in my practice, uh, one of the things, for instance, that I wanted to do um, with the third edition of uh, Connecting the Dots, the project I run in Mexico, I decided to go for, uh, for dance uh, because of the oversaturation of uh, digital. And that was really, when I, when I work in, in um, Mexico, I don't select a topic or a theme, it's more a field of work. And then we develop the activities with, in collaboration and uh, close dialogue with the artist. Um, so dance was, uh, when we decided to go for dance in 2019 was to sort of, um, find a balance with the digital revolution and the digital, um, you know, um, to be all the time um, in front of a computer, whether it's writing or, or communicating or talking. Uh, so for me, one of the challenges is in not being able to, to go back to physical, you know, to, to having to be again in front of a screen and and changing again the uh, perception of, of bodies and, and humanity and human touch. Uh, and I, I'm finding that a bit of a challenge in, in all aspects of life and human, human relationships. Um, I would say that in terms of shifts that I think could really um, create space for um, yeah different different ways of thinking and, and other reimaginings and innovations to be made is an allowance for failure um, I think that there is very little allowance for for for, for the um, just 
the generative nature of, of failures and then for, for kind of a critical engagement with that as well. Um, so I think in general, there's this perception that once something is done, it has been perfected. Um, and then it kind of ends there and the conversations end there and the work around and the research ends there, specifically in the arts, because it's just often like this, it's, it's centered around this like final producing of a thing that can then be consumed. Um, so I think definitely this, this kind of like, it needs to kind of be like a resurgence of a, a space for experimentation that really prioritizes um, play and prioritizes uncertainty and and uh, allows for 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 failure to 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 exist. Yeah. I'm gonna read out one of the questions that we received from one of our uh, attendees, and again, I encourage the public to please type in your questions into the chat interface below your screen, at the bottom of your screen. So the question is for both of you. Um, in both your presentations, natural entities were brought up as strong examples. To what extent do you think the urgency of rethinking our relation to the environment can inform our relation to the artistic sphere? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a priority. It should be a priority to really think about um, to put this, this system or, or nature as, as a core um, entity or as a core topic or priority. And then from that, uh, start thinking how can we create in a way or produce in a way that uh, is not going to have a huge impact or a negative a negative impact, not only nature or ecology, but in society as a whole. So to me, um, I'm um, when I said before that I'm transitioning towards more social and eco-social practices is because I'm, I'm seeing myself having to change that way of thinking and put nature and society as a priority and then start from that. So put the system at the top and nature and then maybe it's going the, the other way around. But um, for me, yes, it's a top priority. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I feel the exact same. I think it's, it's essential to any practice from the art field to sciences to really technological advancements. I think that this return to nature um, or prioritizing the environment is just teaches us the basics, right? The fundamentals around moderation, around sustainability, around um, what it really means to work in relation with something else. Um, and so just as a core foundational uh, way of operating in the world, I think there are so many insights that we can still gain from nature. And I, I think it's really interesting that there's a lot of artists now who, who are using that as a central way uh, or a central point in, in, in their practices. So I think that we've, we've really seen kind of a resurgence and a, and a, and a, and a hyper-awareness of, of what nature and the environment can, can provide, and then also in, in, in return, what we can then give to it. We'll take another question from our audience, uh, also for both of you. Empathy and embodiment are generally seen as implying human contact, but many galleries and museums are moving online these days. So how can we use empathy to quote unquote, re-socialize with or without uh, digital technologies? Uh, hmm, that is a challenging one. Um, and, and again, that's like, I think we're all in that position right now, unless you really have been operating on digital platforms for quite some time, um, we having to reattune ourselves to what it means to, to, to connect, to share information, um, and have these kind of really like human experiences in a very different way. Um, and so I would say for me, that's something that I'm learning. And I think that it's, it's a very much an unknown space. Um, but I, I kind of look forward to the discomfort that, that uh, the kind of the, the newness 
that that kind of discomfort brings um and yeah that's what i can say yeah um, I, I agree with you 100 percent. i think we are all somehow having to learn on the go and um it's about recontextualizing and, and refocusing uh, our work and I'm still in the process of uh, learning and as you said before like many failures on a sometimes on a daily basis but that is part of the the situation or the context we are going through so I'm learning <laughs> in this process the next uh, question also for both of you. What do you think are some of the solutions regarding the democratization of hardware and alternative platforms or more broadly uh, digital resources for marginalized artists? Kefilo, do you want to go ahead with... Oh, sorry. I on my screen you're still talking so i thought you're um <laughs> you're still talking um in terms of uh, hmm that's a challenging one i that for me in particular when i think about the the solutions um around that uh, specifically when it comes to like marginalized or or um, artists that are practicing on the periphery. Um, I would say that in South Africa, what's happening at the moment is that there's a lot of like outreach and, and grants that are being put out so on hubs and um, seminars and kind of these uh, um, uh, ways of then bringing people into the fold. And so definitely that's one solution because I think that we're all in a position where we kind of need to be uh, we schooled around how to now operate in this plane. Um, but I also think it's about um, rethinking as well, um, how we think about like who we classify as like marginal art, marginalized artists as well. Like in that question for me, what stands out the most is that, because I think it, in terms of developing a practice that is in tune, um, it's, it's, it's also allowing for um centers or spaces that are not necessarily operating the same way as the mainstream to use what they have and respond to their environments to make the work they want to make and so the world doesn't necessarily all have to be on this kind of technological digital hyper like visible plane in order to be recognized as at as a yeah as, as an art center or as a, as a, as a generative environment? Um, to me, I think that uh, this is a solution that um, not only comes from, from us as our curators. I think we really need to join forces between curators and producers and institutions, and as you said, also funding, funding bodies. Um, we can find individual solutions about opening up our practices to involve um, artists from um, different uh, areas or backgrounds, but I, I think and when I talk about systems and structures, I think this is something that we need to do all, uh, together, right? We need to join forces if we want to uh, see uh, clear solutions or, or, or to see um, uh, the impact uh, with more, you know, with more intensity, I will say. So, to me, it's about um, us talking to the the whole ecosystem and trying to put or to rethink how we um, do how we go about things and how we do our practices. Um, I would like to bring up uh, again one notion that you raised in your presentation, Kefilo, uh, which was the notion of um, disruption as part of uh, the act of care. And I would ask you both, like, what are the disruptions that are currently required so that our digital futures um, are filled with these aspirations that we have for empathy and benevolence? What would you like to disrupt and how? <laughs> 
I was going to say that I would like to disrupt life in general <laughs> from, from A to Z, everything. Uh, but I don't know how possible is that. Uh, but um, when I think about when I think about disruption in a way, I don't know why, but I keep thinking about two other terms um, about innovation and progress. Because when I was in London years ago, many years ago, these three terms were very hype. And everyone was talking about the three terms. And at some point I was like, okay, I'm like up to here. And I, I really believe that we need to um, find new uh, definitions of what the three terms mean. And in the past, I think they were missing the human humanity touch, I will say. And um, for me, when I think about disruptive uh, practices, for instance, Gilberto Esparza, for me, he's... I see him as uh, someone that is as a human being who is disrupting um, the way we go about things and the way we think about many, many things. Uh, so for me, this uh, disruptive practices is about um, questioning and deconstructing the values uh, imposed by our current economic systems, uh, for instance, accumulation or globalization or um, competition, and uh, then really rethinking about new ways of organizing life or new ways of being on this planet that, um, new ways of working and, and being on this planet that are not so um, damaging, I will say, for nature and for us as individuals and for each other. And we just need to look around and many things are happening, not just a pandemic. Um, so yeah, that's what I sort of envision when I think about the disruption. Um, I would say that for me, disruption um, goes hand in hand with um, kind of dissolving ideas of privilege um, and also um, access and visibility. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done around um, how we create these hierarchies in our systems based on privileges and visibility and hypervisibility. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in. What are the future mechanisms or the future possibilities um, that kind of learning these ideas around privilege or even the existing privileges within these systems um, that we've created would do to, to the structure as a whole. Um, and also I think that an important part of, of disruption for me is kind of the, the sense that it's, it's, it's constantly something that's ever evolving and shifting. So not being fixed um, and, and, and kind of being responsive, responsive to that, because I think the, 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 the one thing that has confined us within, within the art world is this kind of reliance on, on this embedded system that we all know doesn't serve us any longer, but this, 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 this loyalty to, towards it um, that then has, has created all these inequalities. So really kind of working um, in, in a way that, that challenges that um, is, is important. We are approaching the end of our time together, but I'm glad that we have been addressing this uh, question of disruption towards the end of the talk, because the thing I would like us to end on is maybe if you could each give us a couple of keywords as kind of your wish list, what you would like to drop into the conversation for the future, where you would like us to go. Um, and we will end with those on those yeah. notes. And I will just say a few words to close afterwards. So whoever would like to start, if you have any keywords that stay with you in terms of looking forward, looking ahead to our digital futures. Well, I, <laughs> when I think about the future, whether it's digital or not, I think uh, about going into nature and disconnecting from from uh, from digital. To be honest, so maybe I'm going the opposite way. <laughs> I just want to um, be in a digital sphere 
as little as possible when it's really necessary and then uh, reconnecting with uh, my family, reconnecting with friends, reconnecting with nature, reading more books. So I'm really, I, you know, when this is done, I probably need to spend some time rethinking uh, what to do next in terms of my uh, digital consumption. That is sort of what I think when looking at the present and, and future. Um, I would say that I think for me, like the invocation that I kind of want to carry forward um, comes from working in a way that kind of promotes uh, collective wisdom and like the importance of, of traditions as a source of, of learning um, and a source of gaining knowledge. Um, because I think that there as much as we're going full steam ahead and then there's this like great force of futuring that is happening, but I think that there's still a really important work that is happening around like preserving, or not even preserving specific knowledge, but really working with that knowledge in a, in, in, in a very active manner. Um, and so I think collective wisdom and traditions as sources of knowledge, yeah, that's important for me. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Let's hope that uh, we will hold those uh, pieces of advice and those wishes for the future with us after this conversation ends. And uh, because we are coming to an end on behalf of all the organizers, I would like to thank you both, Kefiloe and Carmen, for engaging in this exchange. I also want to thank all of you who have been in attendance with us today. Um, you should know that this conversation will be available online uh, until March 31st, so you can view it again. And uh, we invite you to join us again for the next conversation, which, was, which is entitled Collective Voices for Digital Decolonization. And that will take place with Jet Chumba and John Hampton on March 2nd at 10 a.m. Montreal time, which is UTC minus five. And finally, you can find all of the information about this symposium on the website mullior.ca slash symposium. So thank you, Kefiloe. Thank you, Carmen. And thank thanks you. to all of you for being here. And have a great end of your day. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.